I'm Neil Farina. Welcome to my salon. This is my Caribbean dream. But the minute you start working in your purpose and not giving up, the rest is history. We all have dreams, but there's something special about the Caribbean dream. You're already living in paradise, but you're taking the risk to pursue those dreams in another part of the world. Well, today I'm here with a man that made those dreams come true, celebrity hairstylist Neil Farina. Welcome to Caribbean Dream. Thank you for having me. So for those of the audience members who aren't familiar with your work, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and what you've accomplished? Actually, yeah, I am born Trinidadian and I migrated here over 30 years and I am a celebrity hairstylist as well. I own my own business and the sky's the limit right now. That is awesome. Thank you. So what part of Trinidad are you from? I was born in Arima. It's um, in the countryside as they would call it. The countryside? Yes. And what's it like in the country? Well, you know, what I like where I come from is very, um, how to say, it's Carib, it's very mixed, you know, a little bit of everything, and well, that's what I love about Arima. I love Arima, um, you know, in the sense that the people there are a little bit different from the Tong people, you know, we are a little more, how to say, um, family oriented, like everybody's close neighbors, and, you know, I appreciate that part of Trinidad and Tobago. This episode of Caribbean Dream is brought to you by Visit Trinidad. My dad died at the age of, like, my dad passed away around, um, I want to say around in the 40s. I was like around 10 years old when my father passed away. Mm. And um, at that time, I was a young kid, like in Trinidad, and I realized who was going to raise me to be a man. That was my first question in my head. Who was going to raise me to be a man? And it was a time that I was so scared of my, in my life that who's going to protect me as well? You know, mm. so I turned to my, um, one of my older brother and my older sister and my mom and my younger siblings and um, you know, my life started there actually when my father passed away. So I started working at the age of 11 mm -hmm. in Trinidad and Tobago, which that's normally don't happen in America. And I started at the age 11 and I, at that moment, um, I wanted to help my family. Cause I, we know, of course, you know, Trinidad, you know, we all come from poverty and, you know, not having much in life. And I, at an early age, I wanted to be somebody. Mm. I didn't know what I wanted to be yet and um, you know I gave up school to work to help my mom. What be did you do? I was actually a chef. I was working in a restaurant wow. to, be, to be honest with you. I love cooking and um, it was my passion then but it wasn't my passion. Hmm. So what made the switch to having a passion for doing hair? It's so weird. The weirdest thing in life is things that you don't like is what you love now. So my dad was my barber. He used to cut all my brothers' hair. And actually, he used to always give me this buzz cut. And I hated it because I wanted hair like my brothers and they. Mm. And I went, after he died, it was my first time visiting a salon. And I went to the salon and there were so many pretty women. And I watched the joy that it brings to women in the salon. And it was a weird feeling that I can't explain to anyone. Mm -hmm. And I felt connected. I felt that's who I am. I felt I was a hairstylist. So I went home and I slept on it and I realized that's what I want to be. But I didn't know how to tell my family because, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, it wasn't a typical man's job. Mm. So I was paranoid and scared to let them know this is what I wanted to do. So I actually went to the salon the next day, and I spoke to the owner, and I was like, I told her who I was, and I said, hey, I want to be a hairstylist. And she's like, oh my God, my first male, and she was so excited. <laughs> and I mean, she bring joy into my heart at that moment, because she was so real, and she was, 
how to say, amazing person. So she already made me feel comfortable. So I went back home and it took me a while to tell my mom that I wanted to be a hairstylist. But my mom is a, how to say, a real woman and she didn't knock me and she was supportive. Mm -hmm. And I went, started going to beauty school and I was so scared to go to beauty school because I used to hide to go into the salon because I didn't want people to see me. So I started developing a self-confidence and you know, it's something that a lot of times, you know, in the Caribbean, you, we don't have, you know, and as a man trying to be a hairstylist in a woman's world mm. is very difficult. And where did you go to cosmetology school? Actually, in Arima, actually. There was a beauty school in Arima. Um, she was from Venezuela and um, she was an amazing teacher. And I, then I went to another beauty school in Arima, which is in Omera Road in Arima. And she was an African woman. And, you know, she taught me, they taught me a lot. They taught me a lot. What's one of your biggest takeaways from that experience in beauty school? My biggest takeaway, I think people making me very comfortable. The, the young ladies that I met there 30 years ago was, I mean, there's no word to express. They made me feel so comfortable. And I think that's what made me become a hairstylist because I was so comfortable already with them. So I felt, hey, wow, this is what I want to be. So what's one of your greatest takeaways from beauty school? Well, you know, coming from Trinidad and Tobago with so many pretty women in a salon made me so comfortable. So it was like, wow, the icing on the cake. I'm like, I can do this. And of course, I took the opportunity and I went to beauty school. And right after I graduated, the owner said, I'm not leaving you, I'm hiring you. I'm like, wow, hiring me. So I was hired actually right on the spot. And, you know, again, was another stepping stone for me. But, you know, working there, I worked there for a while, like probably, um, I'll say three years. And then I started saving my mo money and um, saving my money. And um, eventually I earned my own salon. Mm. Um, and then I came and I get married and I started having kids. And, you know, of course in life as a young man, you know, there wasn't much direction. But, you know, I used to hear so many people from the Caribbean, Trinidadian, who come to visit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they would always tell me, Neil, you have more. This is greater for you. And I think you need to come and visit America. And I was like, didn't understand. And it's so interesting that people had seen something in me that I didn't see at that age, because I was only like 18, 19. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand what they were trying to tell me. And um, I work in a salon, and I constantly hear an ad. Families aren't always the most supportive of our dreams if it's not exactly what they'd hoped for us. Have you had that experience with your own family, or did you have family members that were against you doing hair? Well, of course. I came from a Caribbean family, a Trinidadian mother, a Trinidadian father. And, you know, like, being a hairstylist wasn't the typical man's job. Mm. So, you know, like every Caribbean father and mother, they want the kid to be a doctor or a lawyer, you know, something in that line. And I realized that wasn't me. <laughs> but like every young kid, I wanted to be a teacher, I wanted to be a flight attendant, I wanted to be everything. Mm -hmm. But going to a salon, I realized my passion, and that was here. And I had my mom who was very supportive, mm -hmm. and my aunts who, the minute I started doing hair, they all come to the salon and started supporting me. Mm -hmm. And I remember cutting my sisters in the hair in the back of the house and my mom, <laughs> I remember one day my mom came home and she saw my sister and she's like, what happened to your hair? And I had cut my sister's name hair short. And <laughs> she looked at me and she's like, I think you're going crazy now. And I'm like, well, they wanted me to practice. <laughs> so who else should I practice on? My brothers and sisters and my aunts and them and they were very supportive of me. That's very fortunate. Yes. Not everyone has that in their no, family. No. I have a lot of support. That's wonderful. This episode of Caribbean Dream is brought to you by Dasani. Hydrate your body, hydrate your mind. At my age, I, was, I think I was smart enough, and I think I was smart enough, but, you know, again, you know, there's a lot of things that did, you don't get taught in Trinidad. And one of the things Visa have, you know, become such 
I mean, the biggest thing that most people want now in the Caribbean, and I have to say when I went for a visa 32 years ago, it was totally different. My mom and I, and my, my mom, which like I said, is always my golden hero. She, we were in the back of our house and she had a friend who came by and she said she was going to get a visa. And I was like, well, I'm going with you. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had some money saved and I got a job letter from, although I had a salon, they wanted to see that you had a job letter. So I got a job letter and I ended up going with my mom's friend. Mm -hmm. And we had to follow the application. Mm -hmm. And then the application said, where you're gonna be staying. I didn't know where I was staying. And my mom's friend told me, put so-and-so address and I did. And I give my passport and my, that's my passport, that's my bank statement, my job letter, and I give it. Mm -hmm. And she was right next to me, my mom friend, when we both went to the windows. And I remember they were stamping her passport and give it back to her. And then she looked at me like she didn't know me and then she walked away. And I give mine and they didn't give me back. They say, I'll see you next week. And I said, okay. And I walked out and I went to her and I was like, what happened? Mm -hmm. And she like, they stamped my passport, they denied me. And I was like, oh my God. I said, but they took mine. She said, that means you get your visa. And I was like, how do you know that? And I was like, wow, you brought me here. I wasn't ready for this. And they turned her down. And I felt so sad and so sorry that she didn't get her. Mm. But still in my heart, I didn't know if I was going to get a visa. Mm -hmm. So I went back the next Friday, which it was happening faster back then to now, which I know it's a struggle to get a visa to come to, China, to, come to America. And mm -hmm. I mean, of course, the land of opportunity, the lands of dream, and I do understand how many people want to come here. Mm -hmm. But I also under, want people to understand that we still have paradise in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And I was so lucky to get my visa. When I went back that Friday, they handed me my passport. When I opened it, I got five years visa. And I did not waste time. I called my friend who, my friend who told me that he had his own place. I called him and he said, come up. And I waste no time. I bought a ticket. Mm -hmm. I told my family that I was leaving. I left in like three days after I got my visa. And how often do you go back home to visit Trinidad? Or how often did you wow. go back home? Well, to be honest with you, it was a struggle. Most people think that you come here and everything works out in miracles now. It took me like 12 years, the trials and tribulation to get a visa, um, to get your green card becomes such a headache. And 12 years? It took me like 12 years to go back home. To be able to go back home. To go back home to see so my family. stuck in America. I was stuck in America. I, it, it's, you know, again, back then, things was totally different. Obtaining a visa, um, a green card, was totally different. Mm. So I'm so thankful of my journey, how I got my green card. And you know, it took me like 12 years. So I missed 12 years of visiting my family, 12 years of seeing my mom, 12 years of you know, being a part of my family so life. So when you got back, like how much it changed? Wow. <laughs> you know, the thing about Trinidad and you know, when you left your country, sometimes you picture changes and the changes that when I went back I always felt that like I was going to go back and meet things that I left but when I went back Trinidad had developed way more than I expected it to I forgotten a lot of stuff I forgotten how small the streets were I forgot how hot it were I you know there's so many things that I've forgotten and you know I think getting back home the anxiety to see my mom, to see my brothers and sisters, it was like, oh my God, an experience of life. Because living in a place, giving up, in fact, giving up everything that you have to come here for your dreams, and then knowing that you cannot go back home. You love, some of your loved ones passed away, you can't go back home, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I always pray that my mom will always be there when I go back. Mm -hmm. And you know, my aunts and uncle who I, was, I grew up with, they passed away and I couldn't have gone to their funeral. Uh -huh. So there were just memories of me leaving there and memories of what I had when I left. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the sacrifice you make when you come to America, is that you may, be, may, be, may not be able to go back home. You may not be able to go back home right away 
So there are things that you're going to miss. You're going to miss your loved one passing away and not going back unless you're willing to give up and go back home and sacrifice not coming back. So you have, that's the option you have as someone coming from the Caribbean or any part of the world coming here without updating your papers in time so if something happened that you can go back home. Wow, that is an incredible experience. I can't even fathom. On that note, we're going to take a quick pause, but when we get back, we're going to jump right back into that. I'm Tiana Colbert, and you're watching Caribbean Dream. Coming to America, ha. Huh? My first thought about America, I thought apple trees and grape trees was growing in America, and oh wow, I was in for a big surprise. <laughs> 35 years, well, let's say about 32 years ago, I was in for a big surprise. How old were you when you came here? I was probably like in my 20s, early 20s, and um, a friend of mine, again, um, a friend of mine told me he owned his own salon, he owned his own place. Wow. Trinidad didn't tell this story. It mm. wasn't true. Oh, it wasn't? There wasn't much truth into that. So I realized, wow, what am I, what am I against? What, you know, it was one of the shock that I had when I got here, you know, and coming through JFK, mm -hmm. I didn't understand because, I mean, when I walked out that door mm -hmm. and that coolness hit me, I was like, what is this? What month was it? It was around four. Uh, and of course, coming from the Caribbean, I wasn't dressed properly. Uh, I wasn't ready, in other words. I mm -hmm. wasn't ready. I thought I were, I wasn't ready. And um, long story short, I jump in a yellow cab, get to the salon, and um, it was very busy. I was a little bit embarrassed because the wow. way they dressed, I just came from the Caribbean, and I had what we would call a suitcase now, I would call a grip back then. Do you all know what is a grip? What is a grip? Grip is something similar to a suitcase, but it's an old school, you know, suitcase. So if you all don't know about grips, go back and Google it anyway. And that's all you had with you? That's all I had with me. And that's all I could have afford. And I think I had like 30 US dollars in my pocket. Wow. That's all. And those 30, that 30 dollars was client who gave that to me when I was coming. Because I didn't have much money then, and of course, my mom didn't have money. Mm -hmm. As I said, you know, my mom, my dad died at an early age. My mom was struggling with seven kids. She should remarry over. She had four more kids. My stepfather died now, and I was lucky mm -hmm. to get here. And like I said, my God, I was surprised when I got here because knowing my friend didn't have his own salon in his own place, mm -hmm. I was like, what am I going to do? So. Um, the day went by and, you know, we get in his car in mm -hmm. the evening and I realized, you know, the reality and the reality hit me. And that's when I said, what am I going to do? So I was like, where are we going to stay? So we ended up staying in one of his friend's house mm -hmm. for the night. We spent the night there and it was my first experience of snow. It was so bad. Mm. So we drove back from his friend's house to the salon and when I got there, the owner was there and, you know, I had a conversation when we sat down. He's like, how was your first day? And I started telling him what happened. I said, oh my God. He told me he owned a salon and he had a place and come to find it was not true. That's so disappointing. It was very disappointing because it was very heartbreaking because I already gave up my home and my mom didn't have a phone because back in those days, my mom could so not afford a phone. couldn't contact her. There was no contact with oh, no one. That's horrifying. So I was scared because I felt I was lost in a world mm. with no family. Um, so I spoke to the owner and I said to him exactly what happened. And he's like, give me, give me some time. And he left and then he came back and he's like, I'll make some phone calls. He said, can you do here? And I said, yeah. He said, okay, tomorrow we're gonna figure that out. So I went to his house. He took me to his house mm -hmm. to spend the night. And I went, he introduced me to his wife and his daughter. And you know, me being from Trinidad, I started helping clean up the house, you know, it was late. Mm. And I wanted to feel at home and comfortable. And um, we went to bed. And um, the next morning, went to the salon. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want to see you do a client here. And I said, oh, sure. So I did my first client. He's like, oh, wow, you can do here. And I said, yes, I am. Was so that a lot of pressure? It was, because back when people don't know, when you come to America, it's different in a beauty salon. I was working with a lot of Caribbean people, and back then, they were not, how to say, 
the most friendliest hairstylists because they will not share clients. Mm. And territorial. Um, exactly. Mm. And um, I have learned quickly that you cannot take one's client. So I did the client and of course I think it brings a lot of how to say um, fear and animosity. Mm. So and then he gives me the first chair. And the salon. First chair. First That's chair. usually like the chair that everyone's after, right? Everybody want a first chair. <laughs> and I had that. So long story short, I was like, wow, you know, I started getting the walk-ins and you know, I started taking the walk-ins. But, you know, um, of course my fear in my heart because I didn't know where I was going to, my direction, and I know all I had was a couple of dollars in my pocket. So, you know, I stayed in the Y. WCA for two nights and um, you know I started using my money so I didn't have much money my money started going mm. and of course as a new hairstylist in America you don't have much clients so I wasn't making money so I would depend on a client mm. and I would depend on a client to get their tips and mm. there were days when I didn't so I didn't have money to buy food so I would watch other people eat and drink and oh. I didn't so um did you ever have a moment where you thought about maybe going back to trinidad and just giving up on everything yes i the first two weeks i given up because whew, i was scared and um my dream i felt my dream was going to be crushed because i did not want to go back home empty-handed and i felt i failed and there was no connection with my mom so mm. i was like what am i going to do so I got the job. I had my, no money because I spent it in hotels, and um, I didn't have money to buy food. So yeah. I was like, "Where am I gonna go?" Mm -hmm. So I was like, "I'm not gonna let this break me down. I'm a winner. I came here to win." So I did not give up. So the next day, the owner gave me a place to stay. So I stayed there. And um, she had a sofa, she told me you could stay on the sofa, mm -hmm. and she gives me a spread. And it was so cold at nights, and that's all I had. But I made it work because it was so cold at night, and I used the spread as my comfort zone. And one day, I said, let me call my aunt, because I had her number. Okay. So I called my aunt, and I said, I want to speak to my mother. Mm. So. I ended up calling my mom and I told her what was happening. I said, I think I want to come back home. And um, she's like, boy, what are you going to come back home and do? I said, mom, you don't understand what it is like here. And she's like, listen, Neil, let me tell you this. You went there for something. You went for a purpose. Why are you giving up now? And I was like, mom, I don't have a place to stay. I don't have money to eat. I don't know how I was going to survive. Mm. So she's like, boy, if you want to come back home, come back home. And I said, okay. In my head, yes, I said, yes, I'm going back home. But then I felt if I had given up, I failed. And I wasn't about to fail as a young man because growing up in a country with poverty and not having things, I felt that God gave me a purpose to help my family. So what kept you going during moments where you felt like there was no point anymore? What Where'd you get you, the strength to keep where, pushing? After talking to my mom, I felt I did not want to give up. So mm -hmm. I walked from Flatbush. I was born in Glenwood and Flatbush, and I walked from there to where I was staying now, um, where I was living on Cortelio. And um, I cried walking the streets, and I said, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to fight as hard as I can. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going to the salon, you know, like I said, fighting, waiting to get a tip money to buy something to eat. That's what I depend on for like at least a good three months because I didn't have a clientele. And, you know, of course, in America, you work on commission. So if you make $15, you have to give most of it, you know, to the owner. So I was um, like, you know, I didn't have money to buy food. So I would go to my roommate house. I would get home like around nine o'clock at night mm -hmm. and she would be in bed. So I just snuck out the, um, <laughs> the bedroom that I had and go into the fridge easily and try to see what she had to eat. And there was some down there with cheese or whatever they had that I could have gotten a piece of. I would, that's what I would eat and go to bed with some water. And, um, you know, 
they were nice. Like I said, I would cry and cry and wake up next morning, and then I would feel strong about myself, but then I feel weak some way. And, and you lived off of tips. Yeah. I think a lot of people in this country live off of tips. Yeah. And uh, what could you say about that experience? And, you know, there's people that are currently dealing with that. Like in restaurants, people yeah. don't tip sometimes. And right. some people take it personally. And others are like, oh, we don't have to tip. Right. Tip is something nice for us to do for you. Right. So as someone who's been through that, you know, what do you have to say to the people that think that they don't Ooh. have to tip? You know, what those, some people don't understand is that that little five dollars or three dollars goes a long way, and it went a long way for me because I could have eat and I could have had something to drink when the day was up. So it was really important that I got that tip, and you know, um, I started feeding myself with that tip. So, you know, it's I would say people sometimes we may say, hey, you know, it ain't worth it, but it's important to support people and that little three dollars goes a long way because there were days when I used to sit in the salon and watch everybody else eat and what they would throw away is what I wanted to eat and I used to watch the garbage bag and you know the trash bins and saying wow should I go in and take it and eat it but I was strong and I was like it's okay one day I would be better. Yeah people have no idea what others are going through you never know if someone's really, really struggling or how bad it is and what a difference it makes with just a little kindness. Right. You see, and that's the thing about people because sometimes we're so caught up into ourselves that we don't take time to understand what someone else is going through, you know? That's a very good point. Yep. We're going to take a quick break. This is Neil Farina's Caribbean Dream. We'll be right back. This episode of Caribbean Dream is brought to you by Flow. Welcome back to Neil Farina's Caribbean Dream. Now I'd love to get back into your experience at the hair salon, yeah. all the different parts of that experience. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, you know, when I first, you know, like I said, 11, you know, working in a Caribbean salon, like especially back then, you know, it was very, how to say, territorial. So it was hard to take someone's client. And, um, you know, you have to work hard to build your own clientele. So I didn't have money and I wasn't making money. But, you know, I prayed and I said, I'm going to have my own client one day. And of course, within the, as the week goes by, I started building up, you know, a one, two, three client because, you know, Back then, the salon was a totally different, you know, it was, I mean, women were always flowing into the salon, mm -hmm. you know, women wanted to take care of themselves, so I started building up my clientele really fast. So within one year, I actually built up a clientele, and I started saving my money, and um, I started saving my money, and uh, I started paying my rent at the house, because whatever money that I made, I had to pay my rent. So. I was paying rent, I was saving my money. Mm -hmm. And I remember the owner, I didn't have proper clothing, so I used to be laughed at at my clothing because I couldn't dress properly because I just got to New York City and wow. I couldn't afford clothes. Like I said, I couldn't afford food. So mm -hmm. I had to wear clothes that was not realistic for coolness. So oh, it was so cold. That's and all you had. That's all I had. Oh. So the owner of the salon bring me a jacket one day. He's like, have this jacket. And you know, whether it was old, whether it, whatever it was, and I was laughed at. They made so much joke about my jacket that was given to me. But you know, it only made me stronger mm. because everything that they laughed at and made joke of is what I took to make me stronger as an individual. So. Um, I would use the jacket, and then the wind one year, I had, you know, worked and I saved some money. Mm -hmm. And one of my clients actually, I used to cut his hair, and I found out he had owned his own building. And I told him that I was looking for a place. And he said, what do you mean? I was like, I'm looking for my own apartment. And he says to me, come see this one bedroom apartment. And of course, I went. And at this time, that jacket that the owner gave to me was my bank. So every day when I make money, I would 
<laughs> but like in whatever. Say if I make $25, I'll put half of it in my jacket. Mm -hmm. This is how I save my money. Mm -hmm. So I had enough money to pay my rent. And back then, rent wasn't that, that expensive. Mm -hmm. So I came and I had my first apartment in New York City. What did that feel like? Wow, it was a miracle. It, was felt, it felt great. It felt like, yeah, it felt like a million dollar. Like I accomplished the greatest thing in the world, having my own apartment. And of course, that's when my life started changing. Mm. And I started wanting to do things like go out and have fun and you know, live my life. You could afford to now. Now I could more, afford right? to. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, of course, I had my own, so I wanted to help others. So I started taking in Trinidadian to live with me. Really? Yes. I, wow. I had a few um, friends who I made here who were struggling, and I bring them into my house. But then it becomes such a burden for me. So, mm. you know, as life goes on, I wanted to fit in, I wanted to have friends, I wanted to be loved, and I felt that's the way I have to be loved, and I felt maybe if I give them a home, if I give them money, and you know, I, I don't know, I just felt that's what I had to do. How did it become a burden? Early, well, you know, some of them wasn't working, and you know, I had the overhead expense, and you know, of oh. course, it was really tough, mm. but you know, I started living a life of just hanging out and partying, and I forget my purpose. Oh, and really? Yes, I did. I did forget my purpose. Where on your journey did you start to forget your purpose? I started figuring, forgetting my purpose when I got my apartment, and I started making friends. I started so going. So, how many out. years were you in New York now? Or months? this was going into two years now. So, two years, and that's when you started to feel like you were getting a little lost. You were just enjoying the luxuries of right. life. Right. I okay. felt I should live my life now. Mm -hmm. And then I started forgetting what I came here for. Mm -hmm. So I started hanging out and partying and having a great time. And I was making money. I was making money and I was just spending money. How did you refocus? Well, you know, what happened one day, um, I had a car accident in New York. And at that moment, I was laying in bed and I asked myself, what was my purpose? Because everyone who I was hanging with and spending time with, they were not there. They were no longer there. Mm. I was there on a bare lane, and I was like, wow, where's my friend? And I remember having to get up that bed of pain and aches, because I had three fractures. Did you fractures. almost die in that well, accident? it was weird, because I rented a car, and I was driving down on Flatbush by um, Prosser Park, and the car lost control, and I flipped, and I remembered when I opened my eyes, I was in the park. And I remember somebody saying, cut the engine off, and I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So I remember this guy pushing his hand and turning the engine off. And he's like, young man, what happened? And he got me out of the car. And I was laying on the streets. And it was such an amazing thing that the clients that I had just finished doing was passing by at the same time and saw me. Really? Yes, and they came out to support me. Wow. And they're like, Nee, we just left you, what happened? And I, it dawned to me like, oh my God, what happened, what just happened? Mm -hmm. So that's when reality came into my life. What was my purpose? Mm -hmm. And that's when I started rethinking my life because I did not have money saved because mm -hmm. I was partying, having a great time. And I was like, where am I going here on with my life? Because I just only had an apartment and clothes. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything else. So I was like, how am I gonna survive now? So I went back down again from where I started. I went back to square one. Square one? Square one. How so? Because when I came to America, yeah. I didn't have money. Oh, and here I am again. Back there again. Back there again. And I was like, what is my purpose and what am I doing with my life? And that's when I realized where's my friends and I didn't have friends because they didn't come to support me. I had so many friends and you know, there's an old story my mom used to always say, uh, what, bring your friends and show me your friends and let me see who your friends are. Some, mm -hmm. some little Western Indian story. Well, <laughs> I didn't have any friends then because I wanted to be the end guy, so I spent money with these friends mm -hmm. who I told were my friends mm -hmm. and would be there for me. Yeah. And that's when I realized they weren't there and they weren't friends. So I realized I had to make changes in my life. Mm. So I slowly started pushing away, you know, and I started changing my life. I started working harder and I started saving my money. Mm. 
-hmm. And that's when I realized, wow, this is where I want to be in my life. Mm -hmm. And the changes that I made is the changes that bring a different success into my life. Who were the influences in your life that really contributed to the values that you did learn and contribute to your success overall? Like, who are those people that really inspired you growing up? Well, you know, like I said, you know, um, there wasn't much inspiration back home because, you know, when you live in the Caribbean, you, you got to understand 30, 32 years ago, people were living a different life, a shadowed life. Mm -hmm. There wasn't much social media and all of that sort of stuff. And today, social media have become the biggest of life right now. Everyone lives on social media. Mm -hmm. I love social media, but I also do love the life that I have lived. It taught me how to be responsible, and also it taught me how to fight. And um, I think if I didn't, didn't have those tools coming to America, I would not know how to survive. Wow. So I appreciate that, you know, having raised in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And who are the people that influenced you? You know, my mom, my mom, you know, my mom was a great woman. My mom was an amazing woman. My mom had, after my mom died, she had to raise seven kids on her own. Wow. And my, after my father died, and mm -hmm. then she came and she got remarried. She had four more kids and he came and died. Oh. So my mom had to do what she had to do to survive. So my mom is my hero. Mm. She is my hero. What things did she teach you that you've been applying to your own life? Well, you know, you know, like my mom was a fighter and she never given up, even in the days when we didn't have food to eat or something to drink because, you know, coming from the Caribbean, I came from a poor family and struggles was, mm -hmm. you know, our life, you know, and I know there were days when we didn't have stuff to eat or drink, you know, as well in the Caribbean, but my mom, even though she was struggling to make sure that we had food on the table, she would never let us know that. And that's one of the reasons that I felt when my father died when I was probably like nine years old, I remember as a young man sitting there questioning myself and I was like, what am I gonna do? So I given up school to go work at 11 years old, mm -hmm. like 10, 11 years old, right. working in Trinidad and I used to take all my money to give it to my mom for help mm -hmm. because I never wanted to see my mom cry, I never wanted to see my mom hurt, I never wanted to see the struggle my mom faced because the struggle that my mom had for all these years, you know, um, you know, you know, watching my mom being beaten by my dad and um, raising an abusive family, you know, and, you know, there's a lot of things that people don't share as a Caribbean. And back then, you know, women had to live through certain things. And my mom lived through those things when my father was abusive, man. Mm -hmm. I love my dad. May he rest in peace. But it was part of life. Mm -hmm. So all these things I took as a weapon to make me a better man and to be the great man I am today. I can see how you've taken those things and really applied it to your life because you were such a strong person based off of everything I've heard. This episode of Caribbean Dream is brought to you by Visit Trinidad. I started working with my first celebrity, Crystal Waters, and how I started there was mm -hmm. one of Another friend that I made after that mm -hmm. was a dancer. And he would dance with her and he recommended me to do her hair. Mm -hmm. So I started doing her. And then it went from there. And then I moved from one salon to another salon from Flatbush to downtown Brooklyn because I wanted to change my atmosphere. I wanted to be a different pers person. I wanted, I wanted changes in my life. Mm -hmm. So all these were changes that I had to make. So mm -hmm. I came downtown Brooklyn and I started working. And with that, I started developing a different type of clientele in the sense that I had the Wall Street, I had the regular woman, the regular housewife, and I had... Diverse a, background Diverse, of yes. I really started having that. So I worked in the salon, which, you know, I worked there for a while. I looked, worked there for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that I started developing all kind of clients, like I said. And people used to always tell me, you know, this is so-and-so, she worked for so-and-so, and I'm like, hmm. Okay, <laughs> I was unbothered. Yeah. And, you know, one day I get called to do Meyer. From Meyer, it went to, you know, other artists. And one day, I got a phone call. One of my clients called me, told me, you know, one of her friends want to get her hair done. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. And, of course, it was 
Labor Day weekend, of course, we know it's Labor Day, it's Caribbean Day, yes. Caribbean Parade. <laughs> I wanted to be a part of that. So mm -hmm. me and two of my best friends, which I had real good friends, true friends, and we were going out to the Caribbean festival. Mm -hmm. And when I got this phone call, I was like, I don't know, I don't want to do this. And I was telling them, I had a job opportunity. And they're like, why don't you do it? So I had this client who I used to do all this time. And she said to me one day, um, you know, I'm a field worker and you know, I'm scouting places. And mm. I said, oh, what is that? And she's like, well, you know, I work for MTV Making the Band. And of course, you know, it was Puffy who created, you know, talents. And, mm. you know, there was this girl group that he was developing. And she's like, what do you think about doing them? And I was like, sure. So I ended up going to the show and mm -hmm. I saw these five young women, you know, and they were diverse and, um, you know, they asked me if I could do the hair and I said, sure, I would mm -hmm. love to. So I started working with Danny D. Kane and of course they were young girls group, which, you know, was now developing. So I, I started working them. with right. <laughs> so I started working with them and of course, you know, that started up and then Another How did that opportunity feel? It was great. It was amazing because it's Puff Daddy, you know. I mean, Puff Daddy, you know. And <laughs> did of you course, tell all your friends and oh, the friends that were yes. real? Oh yes, actually, um, I had a little cameo as well on oh. making the band. So um, I started doing them, and of course, another client who were working with other celebrity, I got a phone call one day. Hey, I have a friend who wants to get a hair done by you. I was mm -hmm. like, who's that? Of course, it was, you know, Beyonce, and of course. It went from there to doing Kelly and, you mm -hmm. know, um, Uzo Adube, Mary J. Blige. And of course, my life had changed then because I started seeing my purpose. Welcome back to Neil Farina's Caribbean Dream. So Neil, tell me, how has your life changed since you've been working with celebrity clients? Wow, it's amazing. Um, you know, there's something in your life that you cannot explain to anyone. There's a feeling and my gratitude. Now I'm living my purpose and I'm living my life. And I understand when people, what people saw in me is now unfolding in my face. So now I understand what others were seeing that I didn't see in myself. So you got that confidence now. Yes, and my purpose, and I understand my purpose. So working with celebrities, some of the biggest icon and legend America, the world, mm. I have wow. touched and worked. And I'm so blessed that I have traveled the world and I have experienced the other side of the world. So I never took anything for granted because I happened to go places that I always wanted to go, which is where my ancestors come from. I went to South Africa and of course India. And I am so appreciative that today I have traveled in private jets and you know, I get VIP treatments and I'm eating stuff and drinking things that I can't even spell or pronounce. Is that what it's like to go on tour? Of course. You just treated like royalty. Like you are. You are and given you just the do same. Your passion. You are given the same treatment. You know, I have to say, I have to say this much. I have given opportunities and working with celebrities who took care of me like I was their own. We become family and I am so appreciative of that because today I can live to tell my story still. So who are some of the big name celebrities that you've done hair for? Well, I'm so blessed to work with some of the amazing icon like Mary J. Blige, a powerhouse, a legend, Beyonce, oh my God, giving me great opportunity. It took opportunity that I would always cherish in my life. She given me so much that is unspeakable. It's the greatest in the world, 15 years. A journey that I will, yes, a journey that I will never forgotten. Many tours. My work have been on every cover you could think about. Mm. Um, Uzo Adobe, Solange, um, Kelly Rowland, Monica, and of course my own Trinidadian sister, Nicki Minaj. <laughs> yes, my own Trinidadian sister, Nicki Minaj. Very cool, very humble. It was amazing to work with her. This episode of Caribbean Dream is brought to you by Dasani. Hydrate your body, hydrate your mind.
well, you know, I always tell people you have to start from the bottom up mm -hmm. and you have to be in the right place at the right time. And, you know, one thing that I never lost is being humble. I never lost me as a born Trinidadian, a Caribbean man. I never lost who I become or who I was. And um, like I say, sometimes you have to be in the right place at the right time. And I think I was in the right place at the right time. And, you know, me being the hairstylist that I were, I accumulate amazing people who come to my salon that help me with my journey. Mm -hmm. And I am so thankful for some of these amazing people. And are there any steps that someone can take to get to the level of expertise that you've reached? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that I have to say, I'm blessed with, um, I'm, I'm blessed with a talent that I went to school for, but it's also natural. And, um, you know, working in a salon, educating myself. I stay constantly educating myself because I always want to be that number one guy. That's a great quality. Yes, yes. I always, always want to be. Always learning. Always learning. Never think you know Never. everything. And I am, I'm not one of those hair stylists. Mm -hmm. You know, I think today the now stylist is all about, you know, the money, the fast dollar. I am a long-term hair stylist. I want clients for the rest of my life. So I give quality mm -hmm. work, you know, and I want to be remembered as that pioneer. I want to remember want people to remember that it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from or mm. what a young man is looking or what a young lady. Never, never let anyone tell you you can't or cannot. Because I have heard it so many times that you can't. I heard people who told me you're never gonna be that stylist. You'll never be that I work in salons and they put me down so much. They talk me down, they laughed at. But today I'm not saying I'm laughing at them. I want to say thank you to the people who laughed at me and made joke of me because I took that and make it a positive. I took it to grow and to, to win and I'm still winning and the sky is the limit because there's so many great things coming from Neil Farina and there's so many things that, you know, going to be happening in the near, near future. Mm -hmm. So now that you're owning your own salon mm -hmm. and you're doing so well, how does that feel? You know, I'm still the humble Neil. I still come back to my salon where I started. I will never forget where I started. I started here, and I here? will finish, yes. I, wow. When I say I started here, mm -hmm. I started as a hairstylist working in a salon, mm -hmm. and I will never forget where I come from, because when I'm not on tour, which people don't know, when I'm not on tour with any celebrities, I'm back where I'm started. I'm here with the women who have supported me for years. I still have clients who, I used to do the hair from Trinidad, that mm -hmm. still sits on my chair. So. When I'm not out there doing the icon and legend, I'm still back in my salon supporting my client who supported me for years. I would never give up that. And how many people are working for you? Oh my God. A lot? Tell you what, <laughs> today I'm most proud. Today I have a salon and I have over about probably 13 people employed for me. And today I can actually say, I come a long way that I can give opportunity to others. I can give a job to some, uh, someone else, something that I wanted. Now I have paved my way that I can give someone mm -hmm. a job now. And I'm most proud that I have my own business. And um, you know, I know there's so much greatness coming still. Mm -hmm. And I'm just ready to embrace my greatness still. Because I hope to be the first Caribbean man to have his own hairline, his own product line. I hope to be the most powerful hairstylist ever. Wow. And I think I'm there already because right now, I have all the icons and legends. <laughs> <laughs> well said. So your hairline, what separates it from other hairlines? Like what makes it so special besides the fact that you're from Trinidad? Well, you know, for years now, because I work with so many celebrities mm -hmm. and people always want to know how I come up with my art and, you know, create and so. You know, I've been talking with my manager. We have spent a lot of time. We have given a lot of opportunities. Let me say, I have given a lot of opportunities, but I want when I put my name on something, it really meant something mm -hmm. and it really works. And it represents you. And it represents me, yes. Well, on that note, we're going to take a quick pause, but when we get back, we're going to jump right back to Neil. I'm Tiana Colbert. You're watching Caribbean Dream. So, Neil, since you've reached so much success, where do you see yourself going in the future in relation to Trinidad, in America? 
What are your plans? What's your next achievement that you wish to accomplish? Well, you know, like I said, life have a journey and God is a great God. And um, of lately, he has woken me up within the past week or so. And, you know, I'm still, again, there's always a purpose and I'm still questioning my purpose. So mm -hmm. I had a phone call with my manager and um, I said, Janan, um, where am I going now? I was offered TV shows, which, you know, it wasn't something that I was quite, you know, opposed to. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, where are we going here? So, you know, I told her that, you know, I'm feeling there's more greatness for me and where am I going? So, you know, I'm now trying to figure out more of what I want to do. So we are working on, you know, like product line and hairline. I also want to be by coastal so I want to be in LA. Mm -hmm. I want to be in New York. But one of my biggest dreams is going back to Trinidad and opening an amazing salon and hiring young talents and helping them to achieve their dream. Even though they haven't come to America, I wanted to feel the same thing because we have so many amazing style, um, artists in Trinidad. We have mm -hmm. amazing artists like Destra, Patrice Roberts, uh, Nadia Badson, mm -hmm. and you know, these, there's, there's so many other talents in Trinidad. And you know, like Nikki Carby, there's so many people out there that, you know, to, to work with and to do great things with. And I would love to go back home and share my goals and my dream with other young people, inspiring them. Mm -hmm. And you know, I always feel Trinidad is a paradise. And I'm, you know, I love my country. I love Trinidad and Tobago. And, um, you know, my heart still lies there. And I want to go back one day and spend more time and help and influence younger people that, you know, your dream is big and never stop dreaming. You know, keep your dream alive and never listen to one you know there were those who are going to support you and there's no, mm -hmm. those who's not going to support you but also remember that everyone can be a lawyer and a doctor and a teacher mm -hmm. i am so blessed to be a hairstylist and i'm one of the greatest hairstylists and this is one career you can go any part of the world and make money and live a good and comfortable life i can do hair in my bathroom i have done that <laughs> before you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying i have done hair in so many amazing places mm -hmm. you know and you know, never stop dreaming. And you want to give the support to people that were in your position, but you mean younger people. Yes, I mean, you know, I would not just say younger people because I don't want to shorten it. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, some people who are still living the dream and there are people who are over the 50s who still want to That's be a hairstylist. Mm -hmm. I would love that. I don't think you should stop dreaming because you reach a certain age. Mm -hmm. I think this is the time you live and dream bigger and work harder. So the support that you didn't get when you were in America, you want to give to younger people. Right. Of course. You know, I, you know, growing up in Trinidad, I wish we had more mentors. And, you know, I wish people would tell more of their story. Mm -hmm. And I felt, you know, something that we're lacking now in the Caribbean or I want to say even in the United States. Because I just started going to school and talking to young kids about my inspiration and how I become who I am. And they were so amazed by my story. And I think... If we spend some more time as, I don't want to say as a celebrity, as a person who achieved something in your life, mm -hmm. talk about it. Inspire someone with your dreams. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happened in Trinidad. I want to go sell my dream, not only Trinidad, in the Caribbean, even the United States, because I started out here in the United States going to school. I just did career there in school, talking to young kids, you know, about my dreams. So it's the same thing that I wanted passed on in Trinidad, like going and talking to young kids and inspiring them. how does that them. feel when you're inspiring someone? You know, it felt great. There's a, there's a sense of gratitude. And, you know, I said, you know, this is probably my purpose. And again, like I said earlier, it's like we all have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And now, like my purpose, I'm living my purpose. And I'm sharing my purpose with the world and other younger people. Um, you know, I got to say one thing that I... I have inspired so many with my work, and my work have been seen by millions around the world. <laughs> I think I've seen your work even before I knew who you were. Hey. <laughs> you're such an influencer. Thank you so much. And speaking of influence, your Instagram has some beautiful shots. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about the stuff on your Instagram that you post. Wow, it's weird because I never was a social bird before the fly. <laughs> I was never a social kind of guy. Mm -hmm. and one day one of my friends named Ty Hunter who told me about Instagram and I was like what is Instagram because he always on his phone and he's like it's called social media and I was like what is social media he said explain me 
and then he gave me a post, told me about Instagram, and it become one of the most addict addictive thing. Mm -hmm. And I think in this day and time, it's very important to have a social media uh, page, and you know, especially when you in this kind of career or any career, mm -hmm. you should also have a page that you could also inspire people. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of people tell me like, hey, oh my God, I saw your post and that inspired me. You know, you see things on your Instagram page that mm -hmm. inspire me. You know, you talk about when you were hungry and you were walking the streets and you oh. didn't have money, how yeah. that inspired them. And, and everyone I can see those in the pictures. Exactly. And then see where you are now. Right. See, because that's the thing, because people don't know your story because you don't tell your story. Mm -hmm. And one way to tell my story by was by social media. There were times I go live and I tell people, hey, this is what I've been through. This mm -hmm. is my stumbling blocks. This is when I stumbled. This is the days when I was crying and the days I was hurting. You know, and mm -hmm. you know, I hope that my story could inspire so many. I know it definitely will. I know that I'm inspired. Good. <laughs> so tell me about an experience you had that was one of the most amazing experiences in your success that just filled your heart with joy and just, just showed that you have really reached the top. Well, there's so many great things going on tour, traveling around the world, but one thing that stood out in my life was working for the inauguration, the first black president, Obama, President Obama, Michelle Obama, my God, when I was called to do Beyonce here, she was performing for the inauguration. I couldn't believe it. Standing on that podium with so many powerful people, shaking the hand of the president, oh my God, it was a dream come true. And I felt right then and then, I represent my country. I felt that as a hairstylist, it didn't matter to me. I felt I had accomplished the biggest dream and I felt like I represented the Caribbean. <laughs> and when your family found out that you did Beyonce's hair for that inauguration, what was their reaction? Oh my God, everybody went crazy. I mean, <laughs> I kept it a secret because I mean, of course, I never really was a social, like I said, a social butterfly and I haven't done a lot of interviews, so mm -hmm. people didn't know. So. You know, it, and it's still I'm that hairstylist that does not brag or talk about everything that I do. I don't. I, you know, do my work. You go on my page, you will see my work. And that's the way I inspire people. Mm -hmm. This episode of Caribbean Dream is brought to you by Flo. Welcome back to Neil Farina's Caribbean Dream. So Neil, I want to hear about the transition from being just one of the employees at the hair salon to the owner, that transition. Well, wow, it was, you know, like I said, it's, um, it was an opportunity that I wasn't ready for. You know, I was on tour when I came back. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I worked in the salon for over 20 years and um, the owner called me and he says, I need to talk to you. And I was like, I know I didn't do anything wrong, so what is there to talk about? So he said, where are you at? I said, I'm home. He's like, I'm bringing you some coffee. What do you want for breakfast? And I was like, there's some coffee. And he came to the house, and then he says to me, you know, I'm retiring. And I was like, what does, does that mean? And he's like, well, I'm retiring. And, you know, you guys are younger than me, and, you know, I'm over this business now. And I'm like, I just came back from a tour, and I'm like, what am I gonna do? Like, where am I gonna work? Mm -hmm. And he says to me, listen, let me tell you this. I'm like, what? He's like, you're one of my best hairstylists. You've been very nice to me. We've been like family. He's like, why don't you take that salon and do something to it? And I'm like, uh-uh, I'm not ready for that. That's a lot of responsibility. Mm. So of course, I went and I, I was like, this is scary. Mm -hmm. So he said, think about it. He said, you only have about a weekend. And I was like, huh? So I was like, oh my God. So I had a celebrity client that I went and I spoke to. And mm -hmm. she's like, Neil, take the salon mm -hmm. and buy it. And I'm like, mm, I don't know if I want to do that. And I went home and I slept on it. And then he called me like, did you sleep on it? And I was like, <laughs> no. And he's like, Neil, listen to me here. Mm -hmm. And he started using a tone of voice that I didn't hear before. And it was a stronger tone, and I'm like, um, stronger tone. Yeah, 
he started using a stronger tone. And I think the reason why he was using that stronger tone was to take away my fear. And I didn't realize it until after. So but he believed in you. He did believe in me. Mm -hmm. And he said, take this salon and do something with it. And I said, oh my God, I'm so scared. So he told me he's going to send the paperwork to me. And he want me to re um, get my lawyer to go through the paperwork. And I was like, um, all of that? He's like, yeah. So I had to call a lawyer friend of mine, and she read it, and she's like, this is such a great opportunity. And I was like, um, OK. So I just realized I worked, and I saved my money. And I'm like, oh my god, buying a salon? I was so scared, because I just worked. And I actually saved some money. I actually saved some money in my life. I felt so good about myself. Mm -hmm. I felt so powerful, because I had saved money. And I was like, damn, I got to go take this money to buy a salon. Mm -hmm. So I met up with him, you know, I give him the check. Mm -hmm. I couldn't write the check. He filled it out. He says, just sign the check. And mm -hmm. I signed the check. And then I came back to the salon quietly and I worked. And he said, I will be with you for at least a month. Give me a month. He said, now you're the salon owner. Can I have a month? And I said, you going to be working for me? He's like, just <laughs> give me a month. I just want to work with you. Wow. And I was happy because he taught me about the salon. Mm -hmm. So I went back on tour, and I was strategizing in my head. I was trying to figure out how do I turn the salon into something amazing. Mm -hmm. So I didn't tell anyone of the stylists that I bought the salon. So I went back on tour, and then I came back. And then I started on the internet trying to figure out where can I shop for my salon. And mm -hmm. of course, I came back, and there was this um, pamphlet with about salon and you know I was like wow I went through it and I made a phone call to the people it was in Atlanta Georgia I mm -hmm. called them they said hey come and see the salon come and see what we have I was okay. like okay fine and that's when I said I have to tell the staff so I started taking one by one and telling them individually yeah like why didn't I, you want to tell the group well you know there was it's a very interesting thing because there was some of the stylists who were here there were some of the stylists who were here we worked together for years. Mm. So I told her the only right thing to do was to do a one-on-one -on -one and let them know. More personal. More personal. Less showy. Exactly. Not gonna showboat. Right. <laughs> I didn't want it to come across like, oh, I'm over myself, I own a salon. Mm -hmm. So I thought the right thing to do as a person and to be humble was to say, hey guys, I own the salon, you know, and how can we make this our dream? Because we're all Caribbean. There's a lot of Caribbean people. There's a lot of Trinidadians who work for me still. Oh, okay. So, I was like, how can we make this happen? And you know, of course, they were very supportive. I mean, I think they were supportive. There were some of them who wasn't supportive, uh. which is okay. And you know, after the transition, I went, I bought my salon, and I came back, and I said, hey, guys, on this day, y'all have to finish by 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And they're like, why? And I was like, hey, I have to do some renovation in the salon. Oh. So I already had a plumber. I had someone coming to do the floor. Makeover, total makeover. makeover. Time. <laughs> so it was around six o'clock, everybody left the salon and I started breaking down the old station and mm -hmm. Sunday morning, it was like about six in the morning, the people come to do the floors and the floors was getting done and one was doing station, one was doing lights and electrical and cabinets and it was so much stuff going on. Mm -hmm. I was so paranoid, I was so scared. I was oh. like, what am I doing with my life? What am I doing? And the salon had to be open by Wednesday, and this was Sunday. And I said, oh my God, the salon had to be open by Wednesday. People have to make their money. I have an overhead <sighs> expense now. I yeah. have I, um, a owner. I have to pay this bill every month. Mm -hmm. And everything started falling into place, like, you know, the team, station, floors, cabinets, everything was going on at the same time. And, um, you know, I had amazing support. One of the women who was working here as the receptions manager, she was very supportive. She was here with me through thick and thin. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I thankful for her. And she stood with me. And by Tuesday night, the salon was complete done. And I looked at it myself and I was like, oh my God, I did that. So Wednesday, I didn't have a grand opening, mm -hmm. which I was disappointed. I'm still disappointed about it because mm -hmm. I never had a grand opening. But I opened my door for business on that Wednesday. And I remembered when I opened my doors and the stylists came to work and clients 
all I heard was, wow. I remember clients crying in front of someone like, why didn't you have a grand opening? Everything was happening too fast. Uh, I was still on tour. Mm -hmm. I had a, I'm a salon owner now. I'm a businessman. Yeah. I had an employee of 13 people. Lots of moving parts. It's a lot. It was uh. just overpowering to me. And mm -hmm. I'm here by myself, no family member, and I'm doing this by myself. So it was a lot for one person at that moment. So it was the moment I was like, wow, my life is about to change again. So <laughs> I opened up for business and, you know, watching the faces of so many clients who were coming here for the past years mm -hmm. to see something that I have done. Mm -hmm. And I gave them a place to come and get the hair done that they feel they felt so powerful. Wow. Walk, I think walking into Neil Florina's salon, I think a lot of women feel very powerful. This episode of Caribbean Dream is brought to you by Visit Trinidad. What's your definition of the Caribbean Dream? Well, I'm living my dream right now. This is the best dream that I ever dreamt. I woke up one day and didn't have a direction. Today I have a direction. And here is my story. That is so beautiful. <laughs> I love the way you said that. So to a young child living on an island somewhere in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. maybe right from your hometown in Trinidad, yes. or just a person dreaming and looking for inspiration, what is the best advice that you could give to someone watching right now? If you could just hmm. look into that camera and share it with them. First of all, live your dream. Live in your purpose. Never give up. The struggle is the struggle. It's not easy. I promise you that. It's not easy. But the minute you start working in your purpose and not giving up, the rest is history. But never let anyone tell you you cannot or cannot do anything in life. Because there are those who are going to do that. There are those who are going to beat you down. Because sometimes you realize in life there's some of those who are going to support you and some is not going to support you. But that's okay. What I have done with all my negativity is put it into positivity. Those who laughed at me, those who talked me down, those who beat me down, today I'm still standing tall. I walk my street very mighty and strong. I never bend my head, and I will never bend my head for another person. I always lift my head up high as I can, and you should do the same. Never forget that. You are such a strong person from all the things that you've been through. I just, I don't know if I could have done it. But thank you so much for joining me on Caribbean Dream. This has been Neil Farina's Caribbean Dream. I'm your host, Tiana Colbert. I'll see you next time. See you next time.